Welcome everyone to today's lecture. We had um, epidemiology introduced to us uh, a couple of weeks ago when Lindsay Grayson gave his talk on aspects of reservoirs of infections and how some infections are actually spread. I think um, ClinEpi is probably one of those um, science or research areas that the, the, the smaller sort of discovery can have the most fundamental and huge impact on how we look at diseases and control or intervene with, with diseases, not just infectious diseases, but many other diseases. And it's a great uh, pleasure to have Rhona McIntyre um, present today's lecture. She's actually um, the Professor of Infectious Diseases and Epidemiology at uh, um, the University of New South Wales and the Head of Public Health and Epidemiology at the University of, of New South Wales. And most of her research is around um, ClinEpi, vaccinology, and the diseases that she's particularly interested in are, are flu and also tuberculosis. So she's won uh, many uh, awards, in, including uh, Henry Wellcome Prize and also the ACGSK Prize for Advanced Research in Infectious Diseases. Um, so it's a, a great pleasure to have her here um, giving us today's lecture. Thanks, Rona. Hi, everyone. Um, what I'm going to give you today is just an overview of some epidemiologic and um, mathematical modelling methods that we use in infectious diseases research. And I hope it's not too basic for you. I'm working on the assumption that most of you are basic scientists and working on um, basic research. So it may be um, uh, something new for you, some of these concepts. I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the Kulin Nation. And I'd like to make these disclosures that I um, have done investigator-driven research funded by pharmaceutical industries and sat on advisory boards for pharmaceutical companies. So, just a bit of um, a few concepts to remember is that communicable diseases are unique because they can be transmitted from person to person, from either human to human or also animal to human and vector to human. And humans exist in mutually exclusive states of susceptibility, infection or immunity, which makes um, the mathematics around transmission of infection um, possible to calculate. Infectious diseases also have the potential for epidemics and immunity to infection results from either natural infection or vaccination. Just a reminder on the global burden of disease, HIV, TB and malaria account for more than 13 million deaths annually. There are over 300 million episodes of malaria a year and there are more TB deaths now than ever before. Infectious diseases cause about 25% of all deaths in the world and 63% of child deaths. In 2008, for the first time, chronic diseases overtook infectious diseases as a number one cause of death globally, and that's coronary heart, heart disease, mainly due to smoking in China and India. But infectious diseases still remain on the top 10 causes of mortality um, in the world including lower respiratory infections, diarrheal diseases, HIV, AIDS, TB, neonatal infections, and malaria. In terms of low-income countries, um, however, infections still remain the top three causes of death, um, being lower respiratory tract infections, diarrheal disease, and HIV. The risk factors for infectious diseases are not just host factors in the individual, but also socioeconomic factors such as crowding, sanitation, potable water, immunisation, environmental factors, particularly important in vector-borne diseases, sexual behaviour for sexually transmitted infections, and immunity. So, moving on to some basics of epidemiology. The types of research study designs that we use in public health include descriptive studies, interventional studies and observational epidemiology and I'll just run through some of the concepts in these methods. In the 1980s and the 1990s there was an explosion of this phenomenon evidence-based medicine and you hear it everywhere, EBM, evidence-based medicine, it's taught in medical school but um, a little bit of EBM is a dangerous thing. One of the take-home messages from EBM is that the randomised controlled trial is the ultimate in research design and a meta-analysis even more so. But it's actually um, 
Well, let me put this question to you. Here's the research question. Does smoking cause lung cancer? And you might answer, well, I couldn't find a meta-analysis or even a single RCT, therefore the level of evidence is low. And obviously this is not correct. We know that smoking does cause lung cancer. And in fact, the pivotal um, studies of smoking causing lung cancer were, uh, was a case control study and then a cohort study. Then what about this research question? Is school closure effective in a pandemic? Now, during the 2009 pandemic, um, Victoria um, closed several schools as part of their response. You might answer, well, I couldn't find a meta-analysis or even a single RCT, therefore, you know, the evidence isn't very good. I'll come back to that question a bit later on. But basically, the time, you know, when you frame a research question in doing um, public health research, the types of research questions could be to do with etiology, you know, the cause of disease, could be to do with harm, could be to do with diagnostic accuracy, prognostics, um, screening studies, therapy, or events that, have, uh, that may occur in the future. The RCT is only the appropriate methodology for questions of therapy. It's not actually the appropriate research design for other types of questions, such as about etiology, which is uh, where the smoking and lung cancer question comes in. So when we're talking about um, therapy, level one evidence <coughs> is considered um, evidence obtained from either a meta-analysis or systematic reviews of all the relevant, relevant randomised control trials. That's meant to be the gold standard, the highest level of evidence. Level two is evidence obtained from at least one properly designed randomised control trial. Level three is lesser evidence well-designed pseudo-randomised control trials where there might be um, different methods of allocating subjects. Level 3.2 is evidence obtained from comparative studies with concurrent controls and allocation not randomised, cohort studies, case control studies or interrupted time series. And level 3.3 is evidence obtained from comparative studies with historical controls, two or more single arm studies, interrupted time series or case series, and those are considered lower levels of evidence. But the levels of evidence, and you know, there's, there's a whole series published in JAMA on levels of evidence, and there's a different set of criteria for each type of research question, um, and really the criteria are specific to the research questions. And there's even criteria for health economics, there's criteria for um, questions of etiology, and so on and so forth. So just remember the RCT is not, all you need to remember is the RCT is not the appropriate method for all types of research questions. It's only for questions of therapy. So just going back to epidemiology as a discipline, it really began with John Snow, who was born nearly 200 years ago, and William Budd. And at that time there were two theories of what caused epidemics. One was the miasmatic theory, which is that disease was caused by something in the atmosphere, the air and the contagion theory. And there were two opposing schools that argued very vehemently about what did cause disease. So John Snow was a medical practitioner and an anaesthetist in London. He saw cholera in Newcastle-on-Tyne in 1853 and in 1832 he saw the London epidemic and in, 1940, in 1848 again. In, um, sorry, it's meant to be 1849, he published a pamphlet on the mode of communication of cholera. Then in 1854, during an epidemic of cholera in London, he did a really thorough investigation and he examined the distribution of deaths from cholera in South London, where the drinking water was supplied by private operators. And he found that the deaths were related to the degree of pollution in part of the River Thames, where each company sourced its water, and in particular he, he um, narrowed it down to one water pump, the Broad Street Pump, which was uh, the source of this contaminated water. And he closed down this pump and brought the epidemic to an end. And that was really the first outbreak investigation, the first piece of really thorough epidemiology um, in documented history. He published a second pamphlet in 1855 with his theory of cholera being spread by the fecal oral route and person to person, and he determined that defective sewage resulted in contamination of wells and water supplies. And his theory was later proven by Robert Koch in 1883, who isolated Vibrio cholera. William Budd simultaneously published a pamphlet on the spread of cholera and published his research findings on the epidemiology of typhoid in 
in Lancet and BMG, BMJ. So just moving on to this concept of what is an epidemic, epidemic versus endemic. If you read the newspapers, you hear the word epidemic all the time. There's an epidemic of diabetes. There's an epidemic of obesity. There's an epidemic of alcoholism. Epidemics, you know. It, what is epidemic? So endemic is a disease that exists permanently in a particular region or population. So malaria, for example, in many countries is endemic. An epidemic is an outbreak of disease that attacks many people at about the same time and spreads through one or several communities and it's really defined by the rate of growth of the epidemic curve. So it's, it's not about the absolute numbers, it's about the rate of growth, the rate of increase. And a pandemic is what we call an epidemic that spreads throughout the world. Now here's some data with um, data and projections on diabetes from the CDC in the US. And this is not an epidemic. Yes, diabetes is a problem, but it's an endemic problem, one that's been increasing over a long period of time. So it's not an epidemic. It is incorrect to use the term epidemic for diabetes. This, on the other hand, are classic epidemic curves from the SARS outbreak in 2003, which shows the epidemic in a range of different countries. Sometimes it's a bimodal curve, and sometimes it's a unimodal curve, and it's a classic um, normal distribution in the, in the curve which shows the rapid rise of the um, incidence in disease and then a peak and then a decline and that's an epidemic. And it's interesting when you study epidemic curves to look at what the curve itself tells you. This is from a study um, that I was involved in which looked at outbreaks of influenza in nursing homes. And in this particular outbreak, as soon as there was active surveillance, as soon as the outbreak was identified, people who were sick with influenza were treated with antivirals. And you can see that it's kind of a long, flat epidemic curve. There's a little bit of a peak, but it kind of grumbles on. This, in contrast, is a similar nursing home outbreak where not only were the sick people treated, but everyone who wasn't sick was given prophylaxis with antivirals. And you can see quite an abrupt truncation of the epidemic. So if you go back to the other one, look at that shape, and then that shape, you can see the difference in the shape. And that's the difference in the intervention. In this case, just the sick people were treated, and the epidemic kind of grumbles on. In this case, everyone got prophylaxis, and the epidemic comes to an abrupt halt. And that's a picture um, of one of the investigations in those outbreaks in the nursing homes. So moving on to descriptive studies, we um, often use correlational studies in public health and they're useful for studying interactions of environmental or other factors in disease. For example, you can look at seasonality of influenza and compare it to the deaths, rates of all-cause morbidity and mortality and you often see a close correlation when there's a peak of flu, you see a rise in the all-cause of deaths as well. Case reports and case series, even though they're considered the lowest level of evidence, are actually quite useful and historically there have been a number of new diseases and disease syndromes which have been identified first by case reports and case series, including um, HIV AIDS was first described by case series. Cross-sectional studies are useful for determining prevalence rates of various studies. Just briefly on case control studies, uh, case control studies where you select your subjects on the basis of their disease status. Are they sick or are they not sick? And then you compare them, the sick and the not sick, for uh, the exposure of interest. And there are special issues around designing case control studies, um, around how you define a case, around how you select the controls, whether or not you match cases and controls. And the key thing is that when you match on a variable, like if you match on age, you actually can't analyse that variable because it's the same in both. Okay, so that's the trade-off with matching. Um, and sometimes there's merit in doing an unmatched case control where you want to analyse all the variables. And then you need to find out um, how you ascertain disease and exposure status accurately to make sure you don't misclassify. So case control studies are very prone to bias, particularly selection bias. Uh, you can only determine an odds ratio from a case control study, and an odds ratio is an approximation of the relative risk. Um, and you need to be careful to go in with an a priori hypothesis rather than a fishing expedition because you can end up with very um, bad science if you just go in and you know data mine in a case control study. 
The, the strengths of case control studies are they're quick and efficient, they're good for rare diseases or diseases with a long latent period, and they can determine multiple etiologies. The limitations are they're not very efficient for rare exposures, they can't determine disease incidence, which is a rate of occurrence of a disease over time, and they can't determine any kind of temporal relationship because you're only looking at point prevalence, and they are prone to bias. They do have their place though, because some classic case control studies have come up with some really important findings in medicine, including smoking and lung cancer, the case control study by Richard Doll and Austin Bradford Hill. Toxic shock and tampons was also um, identified um, by case control study, diethyl stilbestrol and vaginal cancer, asbestos and mesothelioma, vinyl chloride and angiosarcoma of the liver, all these were identified through case control studies. Cohort studies, on the other hand, are where you take a group and define them on the basis of their exposure. So you could say smoking and not smoking, for example. And you then follow them up for the development of the disease of interest. And they can be retrospective or prospective. The retrospective design is suitable for diseases with a long latency. And you can actually have a nested case control within a cohort study. So the issues when designing a cohort study are selecting the comparison cohort, classifying exposure and disease status again, sources of data and exposure information, sources of the outcome data and adequate follow-up. The strength of a um, case control study is you can actually calculate incidence, uh, which is better than just prevalence, which is all you can do in a cross-sectional study, and that means you can calculate a relative risk. And the relative risk and the risk uh, odds ratio are measures of association. Um, and the relative risk is really the gold standard because it incorporates incidence, so it has the, the quantity of time in it. The odds ratio is only an estimate of the relative risk. You can still get confounding and bias in a cohort study, and of course if you have lost a follow-up it can affect the um, quality of your study. The strengths of a cohort study is you can look at rare exposures, you can examine multiple effects of a single exposure, you can allow incidence calculation, and there's less bias if it's prospective. Limitations are it's ineffective for rare diseases, it's time consuming and expensive, particularly if it's prospective, and the validity is affected by loss to follow up. Some classic cohort studies include the Framingham Heart Study, which was pivotal in identifying risk factors for cardiovascular disease, and the Nurses Health Study. So, now moving on to randomised controlled clinical trials. Um, as I said, they're the ideal study design for questions of therapy. And randomization technically eliminates the effect of confounding. Because if you randomly allocate your subjects to, the, to your arms of your study, you're hoping that whatever confounding factors there are, whether you know about them or not, will be evenly distributed between the arms. Uh, so you can really include some very complex patient groups when you do an RCT. Um, the distribution of known confounders between the arms, such as age, sex, smoking, status, etc. You can measure how they're distributed between the arms to see whether your randomization was successful. And if you find there's a significant difference, say, in smoking rates between your two arms, if, if it's a two-arm trial, you might think, well, something's not quite right with this randomization, and then you need to adjust. So the double-blind placebo-controlled design is the ideal, but these days, um, it's quite rare to do placebo trials because for most diseases that you're trying to tr treat with drugs, for example, there is already a drug out there on the market and it's not considered ethical to trial a new drug against placebo. You really have to trial it against the existing gold standard drug. Blinding um, at all stages, including um, delivering the intervention and measuring the outcomes, reduces the risk of bias. And placebo measures both the placebo effect and also helps to tease out what are true adverse events of the drug or pharmaceutical that you're testing versus um, um, placebo adverse events. And um, multi-arm trials are really common these days um, and the way to analyse it really is by intention to treat, which is regardless of whether people drop out or they don't take the drugs or they don't do what they're supposed to do, you analyse them in that arm and it's supposed to give you a real world estimate of the efficacy of the intervention. So there's a lot of um, issues around the methods of designing an RCT um, and you can get you know, 
well-designed RCTs, but you can also get poorly designed RCTs. So there's been a lot of literature on um, publication bias, and it's been well proven that trials with a positive effect, so showing that a drug is effective, is are more likely to be published than trials with a negative effect. It's also well established that large, well-funded industry trials are more likely to be published than smaller trials that are investigator-driven. And there was one review that found um, that 62% of clinical trials published in the five major medical journals were actually funded and driven by the pharmaceutical industry. Okay, so the trials are designed by the pharmaceutical industry and the, the you know, recruiters for those trials publish it. Medical publishing has also been shown to be significantly biased towards the health concerns of wealthy countries. In the four leading medical journals of the world, published research relevant to diseases of the developing world, which comprises the bulk of the global burden of disease, represented 0 to 16% of the content. Okay, so there's already a huge bias out there in terms of what gets published and whose interests they serve. These days you can't publish a clinical trial without having it registered in a public register and we've got a good register in Australia which is accepted internationally and this is now a requirement that all trials are publicly registered and it's a result of perceived manipulation of research results by industry including suppression of negative findings. So you can go on a trial registry and search to see who's, who's doing trials on a particular um, subject right now and what their defined endpoints are, you know, and then when, when the paper's published you can go back and check against the trial registry, did they actually publish what they said they were going to do. So investigator driven trials are harder to conduct, they're poorly funded compared to industry trials and they're much more difficult to get published. In terms of infectious diseases, um, often you need to do a cluster randomised trial because Say you're doing a trial of an intervention in a, in a community or in a household or a um, village or, or a hospital. If you prevent an infection that's transmissible person to person in one person, you're not just having an impact on that individual, you're actually potentially having an impact on other people as well. So it's quite different to doing a trial of say an anti-asthma medication or a diabetes drug. Uh, which is only going to affect that individual. When you're looking at infectious diseases as the outcome, you, uh, my personal view is that you should cluster randomise because um, so that everyone in that cluster gets the same intervention so that you're not getting um, clouded by herd immunity effects or you know, the effects of transmission from one person to another. Of course, you do lose statistical precision when you cluster randomise and it's um, harder to analyse the data. So adverse events from clinical trials. All trials need a safety monitoring panel. There needs to be uh, procedures for unblinding if serious adverse events become apparent. And there's been, you know, and often you don't pick up, or well, sometimes you don't pick up a serious adverse event in the clinical trials because um, they may only become apparent in post-licensure marketing. And a good example is the rotavirus vaccine Rotashield, which was licensed in the 90s in the US and the trials didn't show any um, adverse events but when it was introduced into the Universal Infant Immunisation Program it be became apparent that there was a, an increased risk of intersusception in the infants receiving this which was much higher than the background rate of intersusception and that was only apparent through post-marketing surveillance because of the number of people required to have the vaccine to see what this effect was and subsequently that the current rotavirus vaccines um, had to that are on our national immunization schedule had to be done uh, had to be proven in trials with in the order of 60,000 infants to prove that they did not cause intersusception. So I just want to touch on the case of Vioxx and you may have heard about this. Vioxx was <coughs> a non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drug um, which was uh, and the large um, industry RCT published in the New England Journal um, in 2000. It was meant to be, it was compared to naproxen as an alternative for rheumatoid arthritis. 
In the trial, it actually showed a four-fold increase in acute myocardial infarction in the um, Vioxx group compared to naproxen. The authors interpreted this as a protective effect of naproxen. Now, this is a classic case of the emperor's new clothes, okay? So the paper comes out showing a four times higher risk of myocardial infarction in the intervention arm, the people getting Vioxx. The authors have said this is a protective effect of naproxen. Now, there's a lot of literature out there on, anti, uh, on non-steroidals and uh, myocardial infarction. Naproxen would have to be three times as effective as aspirin to account for that difference, if it really was a protective effect of naproxen. There's actually no evidence that naproxen is any better than aspirin. And the data indicating the risk of Vioxx was available to the authors four months before that paper was published. The editors saw the data, uh, the reviewers saw the data, and it just passed through everything and was just out there, you know, New England Journal trial. Um, subsequently, when, when it all came out in the wash, that there actually was signif a significant increase in the risk of myocardial infarction from Vioxx, New England Journal published an expression of concern um, and subsequent trials of Vioxx confirmed the cardiovascular risk, risk. People actually died of myocardial infarction as a result and Vioxx was withdrawn in 2005 and there's still ongoing massive litigation as a result of this. So I suppose what that teaches you is to remember the basic principles of epidemiology. Don't assume because it's published in a prestigious journal that it's actually correct. You know, use your own critical thinking. So in summary, clinical trials are complex. There is a risk of adverse events. Um, it is necessary to do clinical trials for high-level evidence in questions of therapy. Um, you need to think about ethical practice. You need to think about industry versus investigator-driven trials and registration and disclosure. So I want to move on now to mathematical modelling of infectious diseases, which is something that my group does quite a bit of. There's two types of modelling. There's disease modelling and there's economic modelling. And it's basically the use of mathematical models to predict the dynamics, the behaviour or the economics of infectious diseases. And it's useful when predicting future outcomes and the impact of control strategies is needed, when an RCT is not possible because the disease of interest hasn't actually occurred yet, and it's useful for funding and policy decisions. So we do have surveillance data. We've got a national notifiable diseases scheme that notifies certain diseases, uh, including most in infectious diseases of importance. And that gives us surveillance data where we can look at trends over time. But surveillance data is based on past data and it gives us a very static um, view of disease epidemiology, whereas modelling allows us to forecast into the future and gives a dynamic um, picture. And there's other, other groups do modelling of interest, you can do modelling of intracellular events and of pathogens and so on, but in terms of public health, we do modelling in populations. So going back to our research question, is school closure effective in a pandemic? I couldn't find a meta-analysis or even a single RCT. Well, you know, you can see that that answer is nonsensical for the question. This is a question where the appropriate methodology would be mathematical modelling, okay, to define, to have a look scientifically and systematically whether this particular intervention, closing schools, will have any impact on a future pandemic in terms of morbidity, mortality and spread of disease. So mathematical models basically make assumptions about a disease. They write those assumptions as equations and then they solve those equations. And the kinds of data that we put into mathematical models include seroepidemiologic data, um, enhanced surveillance data, disease transmission data, vaccine coverage data, and vaccine or drug efficacy estimates from randomised controlled trials, as well as cost data if you're doing economic modelling. And going back to um, human beings existing in mutually exclusive states of being either susceptible, infected, recovered or immune, we can um, model um, population dynamics of infectious diseases in this way. We categorise people into susceptible, infected and recovered and this is called an SIR model. And then we work out the rates at which people transition between these models. And obviously people can leave the model if they die or they can come into the population through migration, through birth or if they have waning <laughs> immunity they can become susceptible again. Okay, so our sources of susceptibles are 
births, immigration and waning immunity and um, people leave the model if they, if, if they die. And we can work out from known parameters of disease um, how, how people transition between these categories and that's the, the fundamentals of what modelling is. In mathematical modelling of infectious diseases, um, there's this concept R, um, which is a really central to modelling, and it's the number of secondary cases generated from one index case. The lower the R0, which is the um, R0 refer refers to the reproductive number in a totally immune, uh, totally susceptible population, okay, so where no one is immune, um, R0 reflects the inherent capacity for infectiousness of that disease. The lower the R0, the easier it is to eradicate or control a disease. And R is, is affected by characteristics of the organism, such as how infectious it is, the duration of infectiousness, so in the case of a virus, how long people shed the virus, um, and also the volume of shedding. And we know, for example, children shed viruses much more than adults, so you might vary your model for children. And also whether there's any asymptomatic transmission. So in the case of influenza, for example, there is asymptomatic transmission, so that becomes important to model that. It also depends on population characteristics, such as the demographics, social mixing patterns, and population density. So in the models, we put in these matrices of who acquires infection from who, where we structure the population by age group, and we look at different ages mixing with different ages, and all that is factored in. So for example, the R0 for measles would be quite different in a city like Melbourne compared to a country town like Ballarat you would get a different R0 because it also depends on the population demographic characteristics. So schematically, this represents um, a disease with an R of 3. Okay, you can see the index case over there at the beginning. It gives rise to three cases, which each give rise to three further cases. And you can see that it then branches out and you get a epidemic that keeps growing. Okay, that's, that's how an epidemic starts. If you vaccinate one-third of the population, okay, so you just vaccinate one-third of a population with a 100% effective vaccine, you then um, <coughs> knock out a third of the cases and you've actually reduced the R to an effective R of 2. Okay, so effectively it's now an R of 2 by simply introducing this population intervention of vaccination for one third of the population. And that's pretty much schematically what it means. Now Anderson and May in the UK are considered the grandfathers of modelling and they came up with some estimates for, for R for a range of infectious diseases. And you can see that diseases like pertussis and measles are really among the most highly infectious. They've got the highest R values, whereas diseases like polio um, and diphtheria have a lower R. In terms of HIV, it really depends on what population you're looking at. If you're looking at heterosexual transmission in um, Uganda and Kenya, it's very high R, 10 to 12. If you're looking at men who have sex with men in the UK, it's lower, 2 to 5. So the way that you interpret R in public health is basically R equals 1 is called the epidemic threshold. If R is less than 1, um, the number of cases cannot increase over time. They decrease and in infection can't be sustained and it dies out, whereas if R is over 1, the number of cases does increase, as I showed you in that diagram with the branching chain, and an epidemic certainly can occur. Now this graph shows you the oscillation of incidence over time and basically um, for any infectious disease, if you plot the incidence over time, you will see this oscillating pattern and it's a function of this, of R. So as the disease incidence here is rising, the R is, um, uh, at the peak of the epidemic there, so this is disease incidence, the R equals one, and then as the epidemic is decreasing because people are getting immune from getting infected, okay? So you've got a certain number of susceptibles, you introduce an epidemic into the population, people get immune over time, and so the epidemic peaks. That represents the peak of immunity, and then it starts to decrease, and R is less than one in this phase. It's greater than one in the, in the peaking phase. And then at the trough of the epidemic, again, R equals one, but then R starts to increase, 
and it becomes one again at the peak of incidence. And, and this is why you see this oscillation over time. And this is um, data on mumps. And if you plot anything, varicella, measles, you see the same pattern. And it just reflects this math mathematical phenomenon around susceptibility and immunity and R. So in terms of vaccines as a, as a public health intervention, um, vaccines result in changes in disease epidemiology. They tend to right shift the age into older age groups. Vaccines cause herd immunity, and I'll talk about that in a minute. You can get cross protection, you can get strain replacement, for example, um, pneumococcal vaccination, conjugate vaccine. There's you know, over 90 serotypes of pneumococcus. And we know that having introduced um, pneumococcal vaccination in Australia in 2005, there's been quite significant strain replacement and that serotype 19A is now a huge problem in Australia. Um, and you can get super infection as well. So herd immunity is where um, you can protect more than just the people who are vaccinated through a vaccination program. It's when the entire population is protected, or most of the population, whether they have been immunised or not, because the number of susceptible individuals is too small for the infection to spread. And herd immunity is a direct function of the R. It's, um, it's 1 minus 1 on R0. Vaccinating enough of the population for a given disease, depending on the R of that disease, will control the disease in the population. So the higher the R, the higher the herd immunity you need to control a disease. And this graph, oops, this graph shows you the mathematical relationship between R on the x-axis and um, the required herd immunity for elimination of the disease on the y-axis. And you can see that smallpox had a fairly low R, around 3 was the estimates at the time. So you only needed to vaccinate about 60% of the population to eradicate smallpox. The WHO has a goal for eradication of measles, which is still not achieved. Um, measles, on the other hand, has a very high R, it's about 15. So you actually need to have, you need to induce immunity in 93% of your population to have a hope of eradicating measles. So eradicating measles is actually a much, much more difficult task from a public health perspective than was eradicating smallpox. And that's the value of understanding the R of um, diseases in public health. So the impact of vaccination in terms of um, vaccination programs, you reduce the number of cases, you reduce the risk of infection, you increase the susceptibility in older age groups if you're vaccinating children, and you increase the average age of infection. You also reduce the input of susceptibles into the population and you lengthen the inter-epidemic cycle, which is when you go back to that shifting, the oscillating incidence over time, like the mumps curve I showed you, the, the time between the peaks is the inter-epidemic period. And this just shows you schematically what happens. Here at the, in the blue is a line where there's no vaccination program. There you get that oscillation of incidence over time, tending towards equilibrium. The red line represents the intra-epidemic period and the peak is the peak of disease. If you vaccinate 60% um, of your population, you get a dramatic decline, you get a widening of the intra-epidemic period, and, but then you do get this, this um, reflex increase again as you get a build-up of susceptibles in your population, and you set a new threshold um, for oscillation. And then if you vaccinate 80% in the purple, you see an even bigger decline, an even bigger increase in the inter-epidemic period and um, a longer, longer oscillation. So just to show you in practice some of the research that we've done around measles modelling, um, measles, you can see in this graph, was quite a significant problem in Australia in the 90s and prior to that. In 1998, um, there was a national measles control campaign because of the, the problem of measles. And that involved taking the second, so at that stage, the first dose of MMR vaccine was given at 12 months of age and the second dose in adolescence to boys and girls as an adolescent dose for, which was initially brought in for rubella control. And at, in 1998, that was changed to give the second dose at four years of age. So the schedule then became 12 months and four years. And you can see that there was a, a further reduction in the incidence of measles following that. Now that's just our static epidemiologic data from surveillance and that tells us a story, but it doesn't tell us much more than just that the, the incidence decreased. 
what we did was calculate some the R value. Um, so the, the y-axis there is the R, and I've drawn a white line there to show you the epidemic threshold, and that's the point when the R reaches that value, you're at risk of having epidemics of measles again. Okay, and it showed that with three different estimates, that's just a sensitivity analysis, the red is a worst case scenario, the green is a best case scenario, and the yellow is something in the middle, that at a certain point in time you know when there's a risk of measles epidemics occurring. And this modelling actually turned out to be quite accurate in predicting when measles epidemics did occur. We broke that down then by divisions of general practice and of course there aren't any divisions of general practice anymore because we've had national health reform and we now have Medicare locals, but that's another story. It is a geographic way of looking at um, primary care. And we found that there were some divisions of general practice which seemed to have very poor measles control, low levels of vaccination coverage, and others which seemed to be doing better. So from a public health perspective, we can say, well, you know, we really need to focus our attention on these particular divisions of general practice that have low coverage because they're at risk of having epidemics of measles far earlier. We've done some modelling on varicella zoster um, virus vaccine in my group to look at... Um, you know, we've got at the moment a one-dose schedule of infant varicella vaccine. We looked at 50% um, coverage, a two-dose, a one-dose strategy on the, on the left versus a two-dose strategy on the right. Okay, so one dose of vaccination for infants versus two. The dark blue is, is um, wild varicella and the light blue is breakthrough varicella, which is um, varicella in vaccinated people. And you can see that you don't make a big dent in the incidence of varicella with just 50% of vaccine coverage either way, whether you have one or two doses. With two doses, you get less breakthrough varicella, but you've still got a major burden of disease. You have an initial decline in the burden of varicella, but you've still got significant varicella persisting after the um, vaccination program starts. On the other hand, if you move to 90% vaccine coverage, vaccinating 90% of your infants, you get a much bigger decline and with one dose you get uh, you, the bulk of your disease that you're going to see following that vaccination program is breakthrough varicella but um, if you move to a two dose you really have a substantial impact on varicella zoster virus transmission um, both breakthrough and natural disease so this this kind of work is really helpful in um, informing policy decisions about our <coughs> national immunization program and then we can also look at it by age group to look at um, what happens in the adult age groups. So the older age groups are in orange and, and red, and you can see that either way you get a comparative increase in the burden of disease in the older age groups. And of course varicella is more severe in adults than it is in children, so that's not an insignificant finding. You can also look at what happens to herpes zoster, the reactivation with varicella, um, after introducing infant varicella vaccination. Okay, so you might control varicella in infants and children, but you do get this increase in herpes zoster, and that's thought, which is quite sustained for about a period of about 40 years, you'll get an actual increase in herpes zoster, and that's because it's thought that um, herpes zoster incidence or shingles is affected by boosting to wild type varicella. So in the community, if you've got a lot of circulating varicella, People are getting boosted all the time um, and it, it actually has a protective effect against herpes zoster. But if you take that away by vaccinating all your infants against um, varicella, you lose that boost and you're actually going to get an increase in herpes zoster. And that, you know, there was data by Hope Simpson um, uh, which shows that the, shows very well how the incidence of herpes zoster increases exponentially after the age of 50. You'll now see um, the age of herpes zoster onset, you know, dramatically lowering after this kind of vaccination program. So, modelling is quite useful in public health. Um, it needs to be, and you know, like any model, it's only as good as what the, what you get out of it is only as good as what you put into it, and there is some bad modelling out there. If it's multidisciplinary, and if it's underpinned by good data and sound assumptions, and if it's transparent and easily reproducible, so if you can read a paper, and if you can go away and reproduce that model, then it's a good paper and it's not a black box model. There's a lot of stuff out there that is black box modelling. Um, and disease and economic modelling is useful in the design of um, vaccine programs and elimination strategies. It's useful for informing policy and funding decisions.
It's useful in anticipating emergencies so that you can actually plan your strategies rationally and it gives more information above just routine past surveillance data. So I've got a um, Centre for Research Excellence in Immunisation in Understudied and Special Risk Populations and we're actually having a workshop on mathematical modelling and health economics. That's the first workshop that we're having um, which is in November this year. If you're interested you can come to Sydney and uh, sit in on this two day workshop and learn a bit more about modelling and health economics. But I wanted to just also mention that, you know, research tends to happen in silos. Um, you know, there's people doing basic science research and they're in one silo. There's people doing clinical research in another silo, epidemiologists and public health people in yet another silo, modellers functioning on their own, reading the papers and writing pa their own papers without really consulting with anyone else. And there is more capacity, I think, for interactive <coughs> and um, collaborative research between different disciplines in medical research. In my particular group, we do a range of things around both clinical trials, social research, epidemiology, economics and mathematical modelling. And we try to work towards multidisciplinary research, bringing all these things together. So when we actually plan a clinical trial, we call along our modellers and we say, we're planning this clinical trial. We want to look at the efficacy of X, Y, and Z on this particular disease. If you want to do some modeling to inform policy options better, how should we design this trial optimally? So we get everyone involved right at the beginning of the research so that all the disciplines are working together. Of course, it's a challenge to do multidisciplinary research because research settings are often not multidisciplinary. You really need to change research culture and you need to um, collaborate. And that's about it from me, but I'll just thank all the people in my um, research team who do a lot of this work. Thanks very much, Rana. Questions? Very nice. Well, it usually depends on the time points for follow-up. So most trials will have set time points scheduled for follow-up. And if you can't contact someone at their scheduled follow-up time, then they're lost to follow-up by definition. You might try again after that, but if they're lost to follow-up at that time point, then you've missed that opportunity to get their follow-up data at that time point, which is what you need. So it really goes along to the scheduled follow-up times. Yeah. Hi, could you just uh, expand a little bit more on the cluster randomization that you're talking about? I wasn't really clear on, on uh, whether this is a group that is counts as one sample or yeah. So, so your clusters are one unit and they could be, you know, as small as three people or a hundred people, depending on whether you're doing a village or a hospital or a hospital ward or a, um, whatever, a household. Households are commonly done and villages are commonly done in cluster trials. So everyone in that cluster gets the same intervention. Right, okay. Yeah. But, but you presumably keep track of how everyone in each of those locations uh, is doing. Yes, yes. Yes, everyone gets followed up as an individual, yeah. but the intervention is randomised to groups of people. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, how does vaccination result in increased susceptibility in older populations? So basically, if you um, vaccinate children, most of our vaccination programs are in children, although there are some adult vaccination programs as well, um, you... Give, you confer immunity to the younger age groups and because most diseases and most vaccines have waning immunity, you get more waning immunity in the older age groups and so your younger groups are more relatively more protected and so you get a shift in the epidemiology of disease towards the older age groups. No, if there was no vaccination, the, the burden of disease would be more in the younger kids because they're the ones, well, children for various reasons have more contact with each other, they transmit more easily, they shed virus for longer, they're kind of super spreaders.
Um, so if, if you've got susceptible children, um, they will, the bulk of the transmission will be going on in those kids. So when you protect those kids, then you're um, changing where the transmission is happening to older age groups. And it's a classic, a classic example is pertussis. You know, we started off with pertussis vaccination programs just in infants, and over 30 years, the time points of the pertussis schedule has increased to older and older in children. Now there's an adolescent point, and now there's a um, recommendation for parents who are planning um, to have a child to get vaccinated, and you've seen a shift correspondingly um, to older and older age groups having pertussis. And now the bulk of the disease of pertussis is in adults, and we're actually seeing deaths in the elderly from pertussis. Uh, are, are there circumstances, or have, have you seen many in which uh, it might be ill-advised to go through a vaccination type route because of that type of effect that you might say transfer the, the main instance of the disease to an older population, maybe less equipped to deal with it? Well, I guess varicella is, a, is an example where there could have been question marks about it because, firstly, because um, chickenpox, the primary disease, is more severe in adults than it is in children. So if you're vaccinating kids and moving the burden of disease into adults, you know, is that a good thing? Secondly, because of the potential impact on herpes zoster shingles, which also has quite a serious burden of illness. It's, um, it, it can go on to post herpetic neuralgia, which is a chronic pain syndrome. About 10% of people who get zoster get post herpetic neuralgia, and it's quite a debilitating um, condition. So the burden of disease is quite significant. So that's, an, that's the best example I can think of where you can question the um, policy decision. I think it's an important question, and just to follow up on it, like for example, is there, <clears throat> can you model what degree of efficacy you require in a vaccine before it might actually be doing harm? Yeah. And the good example would be malaria, where you might have a not particularly efficacious vaccine. You know that natural acquisition of, of malaria might actually promote some immunity. So are you shifting sort of towards more um, severe disease, like cerebral malaria, by giving a, a less efficacious mm -hmm. vaccine? Yeah, and that's an ideal um, question to model or also to do health economics analysis on where you can say at what level of efficacy is a vaccine going to be cost effective in a population. Yeah. And, and health effective in yeah, terms of could actually effective. be causing more danger. Yeah. 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 Oh. Um, do you know how many clinical trials were unknowingly repeated because that of the previous trial was yeah, I think in all research, you know, the Bradford Hill criteria for causation include reproducibility of results, and that's a standard in all science. I think you find that many, many research groups often address the same question and repeat the studies, and when you've got a body of evidence all showing the same thing, then, um, you know, it's suggestive. However, vaccine trials, like rotavirus vaccine, for example, where you need to do a trial of 60,000 kids to prove that it doesn't cause intersusception, then you're not going to get lots of groups reproducing the trials. It's only going to be the pharmaceutical industry who can afford to do trials like that. So in terms of investigator-driven trials, yeah, you often see um, them repeated by, by different groups. I meant, um, you said data that was negative was less likely to be... Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, that's the purpose of so we've now got clinical trial registration so you can actually go and check you know if you know that a particular pharmaceutical company did a trial and the results aren't published you can guess that it was a negative result but it's registered so it's out there in the public domain yeah yeah, yeah I have two questions on your oscillation model that one's like the first one you have R equals to one in your minimum negative yeah what does that mean like why you get the that's the like R equals to one there. And my second question is, uh, even though you have vaccination, uh, why you get the epidemic reappear, even though it's, a, it's, it's almost the same thing as the first epidemic, right? Yeah. Is that because of the uh, immunity in the older population or it's just that the vaccination yeah. is not working? So in terms of the first question, the y-axis for that graph was disease incidence, not R. Okay, so it's disease incidence going up and down, up and down. And R also oscillates in the same way, but, but um, 
and no, but yeah, it's yeah, and and so at, and it's and and relating to your second part of your question, it's about susceptibles in the population. So the population is dynamic in term; it's never static in terms of the number of people who are susceptible and the number of people who are immune. It's constantly changing. So um, you've got people being born into the population who are susceptible. You've got people with waning immunity who become susceptible. So it's a constantly fluctuating state. So with any, inf uh, particularly with the viral infections like measles and so on, when you have an epidemic, it will burn out eventually because people will get um, immune just from the epidemic. And then um, you gradually get a build-up of susceptibles in the population over time. And then when you get reach that critical threshold of R equals 1, um, you are susceptible to epidemics again, and then you can have another epidemic, and then you mop up all your susceptibles, and so on and so forth. So it's really about the susceptibles in the population, and that keeps changing because of births, waning immunity, and deaths. Just uh, one more question uh, before we take a break. Yep. Uh, just back to the publication of negative results from RCTs. Uh, you said that sometimes um, a publication in a well-regarded journal might not, might not actually be correct. How are GPs supposed to know? I mean, they're the ones that sell the drug and prescribe it. Are they likely to go and read the journal and understand the faults of a particular study? Um, I think most medical students, when they go through their medical training, should should get enough of a grasp of some of the basics to be able to um, interpret a study. But in practice, I would doubt that most GPs would go and read the journal articles. They're probably relying on industry reps to come and tell them about the latest research, and that in itself is fraught. <coughs> Well, close questions there. Thanks uh, very much, Ryan, for an absolutely amazing talk on Clean Epi. And uh, everyone's welcome to come out for lunch if you've got more questions. And uh, thanks again. I'll be